you know, we talk about the gospel, meaning it's the good news. And it is good news, but it's news that is better than I or you, because I know this to be a fact you're human, fully understand or really believe. We don't think it can be better than what we think it is. We think it's pretty good for those of us who have accepted the gift God has extended to us. But the more we grow and the more we come into a deeper relationship and the more we learn, it's just like, this is better than what I thought. And it was awesome at the beginning what I thought, what I experienced. But it, it's just like, oh. But sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Bo teaches a model called storytelling. You share the gospel by storytelling. And, and evidently, I mean, this is a big deal. They go to lots of training. I've been doing this all my life. I just love to talk and tell stories. So, you know, this is what I do. So this will kind of be a, a picture of storytelling the gospel. Last week, Duke over Easter, and it was an amazing Easter, people. You, it was absolutely amazing. We had salvations, which you always want to see. But let me tell you, what was even, that, as great as that it was, and that was a highlight, one of the other highlights was how you loved and served and welcomed people into these doors who many of them had never been here before. And you loved them and you welcomed them and you did it with such warmth and genuineness and excellence that people walked out, just some of them shaking their heads, going, we have never been in a place like that. And we said, good, come back. So, the gospel according to water bottles, the good news in water bottles. Now, why water bottles? Well, partly because in the sense of a water bottle is a good picture of an intentional picture of what it is. A lot of thought and I can tell you tens of thousands of dollars or probably millions went into designing a water bottle. It was carefully thought about what its purpose was going to be, what its use was going to be for. And so men and women of creativity and design went, you know, the point of the water bottle is to show what's off in the water bottle. So we're going to intentionally make it clear, like this, so that when... I am hot and thirsty and have just got in from mowing and weed eating my yard. I can look at that water bottle and go, oh, that's exactly what I need, and pop that lid open. And if I'm in the store or whatever and I'm having a thirst attack, I can, I'll look at it and go, yeah, that's what I need. That's what my body's crying out for. I know what that is. So there was an intentional design that when you looked at this, you knew what it was, what it's for, its distinct purpose. There was no doubt about it. So that's why I chose water bottles. Now, we're going to go back to the beginning. Because the good news starts in the beginning. And the beginning always starts for us in Genesis. So, in Genesis, the first chapter, we have this account of God... In the, and I'm talking about this in the plural sense. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit evidently had been thinking around in some ideas, and they were going, hey, let's make something. Something absolutely awesome and amazing. And they were looking out, and they said, let's create a world. So God begins to speak. Now, what's unique about God is God is the only being who can create something out of absolutely nothing. God does not need fundamental building blocks of creation and, and, and material like we know and think of. God has the creative ability to think it and speak it, and boom, big bang, there it was. So for those of you who secretly and won't admit to it, for whatever reason, watch the big bang theory. <laughs> you can go ahead and hum the song, it's okay. The Big Bang, that's what it was. So God speaks and he's like, okay, so let there be, boom, and there it is. And let there be light, boom, there's light. And then there's a lesser light. And he goes down and we have this record of all of these things and um, creatures and plants and whatever and water. And 
uh, that he creates. Now, on the last day, God says something very important to us because it is about us, myself and yourself. He's sitting there and he goes, you know, now it's time to create the pinnacle of what it is and the whole purpose of everything that we've been doing here. Let's make man. And when the man, word man is used there, it's talking humanity. So let's make humanity so that they can tend and bring order into the chaos of the world and let's make humanity in our image and in our likeness to take care of all of this. And so God, instead of just speaking, which he could have just spoke, breaks from his pattern and he reaches down and he grabs a clump of the earth and he's the first potter. And he starts to work it. And he begins to shape it and with, remember what the parameters are. He's going to shape this, this particular creation in his image and in his likeness. So it goes beyond just speaking something into existence. He's beginning to mold and shape into his image and likeness. This creation he's called man. So he forms, you know, and he puts it all together. And he said, ah, there it is. There's humanity. And he looks at it, and he goes, okay, this is Adam. This is humanity. And he goes, ah, when they look at that, when the rest of all creation, everything I've created, and then those other created things that I've created that are in the spiritual realm, what we call the spiritual realm, when they look at Adam, at humanity, they'll know who they are. They will clearly be able to see that this is made in my image oh wait a minute but it's more than just about image I want to show you something can you see this who is this is this really Abraham Lincoln it's an image of Abraham Lincoln and if you went to school you ought to know this so that if Abraham Lincoln suddenly appeared standing behind, beside me, which after you all passed out and came to again, <laughs> you would recognize, hey, that's Abraham. But is it really Abraham? Does this reveal who he is? No, it doesn't. That's an image. Likeness reveals who they are, who you are in the likeness of God. See, God created things and he said, okay, here's the one, here's the prototype. Now it's going to recreate itself after its own image and likeness. So like, I am human. And if you had a dog next to me, we are not the same, right? We are not in the same likeness as each other. Even if you put a primate beside me, like a chimpanzee or an ape, we may look similar in some things. Be very careful how you respond to that one. <laughs> but we are fundamentally in different likenesses. Okay, so God said, ah, here's man, here's, he's in my image, he's holding in, him up. But there was something missing because the likeness of God was not yet in him. So what God does is it says he took man and he breathed. And when he breathed, God put his likeness into Adam. Yeah. Ooh. See? Now... Not only was there the image of God on the outside, it was the very essence and likeness of God on the inside. God breathed into humanity his spirit. That's what sets us apart from every other created being on this planet. You and I were meant to look like God, have his image, but also to have the very spirit of God in us 
And when we are like that, that's our identity, that's who we are, because God had a very specific purpose. He said, now what they're going to do is he looked at the man and the woman, because we're both created in the image of God, with his likeness, and he said, this is your job. Your job is to bring order. You're to rule in my name and in my way on this entire planet and bring order and creativity and beauty into this chaos that's out there outside the garden I've placed you in. And don't worry about it because all of creation will recognize in you me. Because you are truly sons and daughters of me. And... In that, he gave them two things. He gave them their identity, who they were, and he gave them their destiny and their purpose. They were to rule and reign. So if you're made by the ruler and creator of all things, you get, and you're made in his image and likeness, you get to rule and reign and do what he does. Now, to bear this story out, God does a really interesting thing. He says, I've made everything. Now, I'm going to bring them before the man. This was before woman was created. And he sits back and he goes, hey, let's see what he names them. Now, remember, if you've been here a while, name means more than just a label. When we speak, when God spoke into something, it put their very essence and purpose into them, but he left the naming of all of the animals and the creatures to Adam because it's going to demonstrate the likeness of God. So God said, okay, Adam, you stand on that rock over there. This is my, I'm adding to the picture. He says, you stand over there on that little hill, and it clearly says God brought all of the creatures to parade before Adam to see what it is he would name them. So this one big lumbering animal comes around and has this really long thing hanging out in the front and these beautiful white tusks out and these big flappy ears, and it's walking along, and it's looking at Adam going, what are you going to name me? What are you going to name me? And Adam looks at it and he goes, ah, you're an elephant. And instantly that elephant became an elephant. The very nature of an elephant took hold in its ears. And now that tusk is like, oh, yeah, I've got it all together. And so more creatures walk in front of Adam. And then this other one, a little bit, oh, maybe about that tall tail sticking up, maybe a little bit. And he's looking at it and he's going, hmm. I think I'll call you a cat. And if you're Spanish, that's gato. And all of a sudden that cat went, arched its back, stuck up its tail, got a little attitude and walked right out of the garden and was never seen again. <laughs> you got to watch that naming bit. But Adam is in the image and likeness of his father, God. And God gets said, you have the authority to do this, name them. And when Adam spoke, things happened. He saw what the Spirit was doing and he spoke and the Spirit moved and it happened. So two things. We rule and reign and who we are is in the image and the likeness of God. So God makes woman out of man because on all this naming, Adam looked around and he's like going... This is all really awesome and cool. But there's nobody like me. There's nobody like me. And God goes, yeah, that's right. There is nobody like you, but oh, have I got more for you. And so he puts Adam to sleep. He puts Adam to sleep and he reaches within. Here, this is important. He didn't pick up another clob of dirt and start molding. He reached into Adam because it had to be, what did Adam say? Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, someone who is like me. And God reaches in and he yanks out a rib and he goes, oh, in a rib, man, that wasn't just dirt. Man, that was hard on the outside and soft is strength. Just, that was a comment. <laughs> I had to make up for what Duke did last week, okay? If you weren't here, get this, get the, listen to the MP3. You'll, you'll know what I mean. So he makes woman, and he brings woman to, to the man, and he goes, yes, finally, something 
someone who is like me. Yes. So God looks at him and he blesses him. And he goes, be fruitful and multiply. Repro reproduce after your kind because as you reproduce after your kind, you are reproducing my image and likeness. And it's going to spread throughout the earth. And they're like, yeah, ooh. So they are in this beautiful place. They've got this lovely garden that was placed in Eden that God made for them. And they had all this wonderful, he told them, of the uh, fruit of the tree and the seeds that produce plants on there. You can have all this wonderful stuff. Now, but I just want to tell you something. There is one restriction. There are two trees in the middle of the garden. Of the one you can eat to your heart's content, it's the tree of life. You eat its fruit and it will bring life to you and, can, and bring, I'm, I'm assuming, some other things too. He said, now there's this other tree that's planted in the garden. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat the fruit of that tree because if you do, you will surely die. Which brings a question, why in the world would God put that tree in the garden to begin with? Right? Well, because it points to a truth. God wants us in a relationship that's freely given and freely received, that it's reciprocated. It's not mandated. You don't have a choice. And God wanted that relationship enough to place the very thing where we would choose whether we wanted that relationship or not. Because that is a true love relationship on one that is chosen, not made. So, everything's rocking along. Things are going great. The man and the woman are just, they're having a great time in creation. I can only imagine. I have a good imagination, so there are some things I can imagine. And God's like going, this is really great. This is really good. Now, it would be awesome if the story ended there, but as you know, it does not. The tempter came. The wisest and the sneakiest of all the creatures God had created. He calls, it's called the serpent, which was the enemy in disguise. And evidently, there isn't a problem with evil coming in where good is. You know, because Adam and Eve were secure in who they were. Evil wasn't good. They didn't really recognize that it is evil. But, you know, he's coming in and we're told in the story that the serpent comes in and he's talking with Eve. And he said, let me ask you a question. Did God really say that you can't eat of any tree in the garden? And, and Eve's like, wait, what? No, no, that's not what he said. God said we can have, uh, eat of any tree in the garden. It's just that one over there, the knowledge of good and evil, he said, don't eat it. Oh, and don't even touch it, because if we do, we're going to die. And serpent's like, really? Well, you know, you know why God doesn't want you to eat of that fruit, don't you? No? Listen, God doesn't want you to eat of that fruit, because he's holding out on you. Because he knows as soon as you eat that fruit, you'll be like him, knowing both good and evil. And Eve considered it. The thought was there. Is God holding out on me? She says she considered it and she looked at the tree. It's kind of like going in and there's that, you know, that thing that you start obsessing about, the thought gets planted, and you know it's not true. You go, no, that's not what God really said. And, and, and I'm made in his image and likeness, but man, I start thinking about it, and I start obsessing on it. And then she goes, man, that tree has one of the most beautiful trees in the garden, and that fruit, oh my gosh, isn't it just perfectly shaped? It's so lovely. I can just, oh, I can just imagine its taste. Oh, doesn't that, mm, no, wait a minute, no. But, oh, it's so beautiful. 
And you know, the serpent's over there going, yeah, isn't it great? Remember, you know, as soon as you eat it, you'll be like God. So she considers it, and then she goes, wow, it's good looking. I've always thought about it. I've, I've wondered about it. I can't seem to get it out of my mind. It must be a good thing, and I want to be like God. And she takes the fruit, and she takes this big, long, I can just imagine this huge bite of whatever it was, and I imagine it like a big, juicy peach right at the peak of perfection and ripeness. And when you bite into it, it's super sweet. And its juice just starts coming down your face. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's good. And then she looked, and Adam's right there beside her. And she goes, oh, don't worry. This is good. And Adam goes, yeah, I want some of that too. And they take it. And that first bite had to be incredible. But all of a sudden... Their eyes, it says, were opened. And in that moment, they knew something had changed. Now remember, Adam and Eve are in the garden, and it says they were naked and not ashamed. They were completely open, vulnerable, transparent to the nth, and they were unashamed. But as soon as they did that, and they took that bite... Something happened on the inside of them. You see, Duke talked about last week, if they had just kind of like went boom, it was just an action-based issue, they had touched and they went, oh. See, God said, did, never said, don't even, don't touch it. It was what the symbolism and the action of reaching out and grabbing it and making the choice to take it within themselves. They took it within themselves. And what happened when they did that is a tragedy that affected the earth for millennia. They took the fruit off the tree and they looked at it and they went, oh, that's pretty. That's good. And when they took it within themselves, what was in them was changed. What was in them changed. It was too small. I didn't wear my glasses because I think I can get along without them today. Uh-oh. They took sin within themselves. And now does that look like the likeness of God? Mm -mm. The very spirit of life that was in them was corrupted and death came and it no longer had the likeness of God in them and to make matters worse sin not only affected their nature but even on the outward when sin has its effect the curse came in and it even affected the physical as well it distorts it mars it ruins and that which we had been created to reflect the very image and likeness of God suddenly went from what was perfect and like God to this the nature inside us died. Because see, in the moment that they did that, they realized they were naked. And you know what the kicker was? They became ashamed. Shame entered into their being, into their consciousness. And the very one that would come and walk and talk and have fun with them and commune with them every day, when they heard him come into the garden, they ran and they hid. And that which had been perfect was broken. And God's going, hey Adam, Eve, where are you? Where are you? And Adam shouts out and he goes, we're, hide, um, we're back here, we're hiding. Well, why are you hiding? Because we're naked. And we're ashamed to be naked in your presence. And he looked, and you hear this voice now. I don't know about you, for years I heard it, God's response says, well, who told you you were naked? Like he was mad. I don't believe that anymore. This is what I think God did. He went, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of that fruit, of that tree, of 
the knowledge of good and evil? And Adam's like, yeah, I did. But it was her fault. <laughs> that woman you gave, you know, I like this, that woman you gave me, it's her fault. She tricked me. And Eve's like, and God looks at her and he said, Eve, what happened? Is that true? I almost have this sense of God going, oh, heartbreaking, but going, is that true? Yeah, it's true. But it wasn't my fault. It was that snake, that serpent. It was his fault. And at that moment, God turns, and what broke his heart was that what was in his image and likeness, what he loved above all creation, was now broken and a shame. And not only had it to do with things on the outside, maybe things we do or whatever, but it was that knowing on the inside, I am not right. I am incredibly broken on the inside. I know who I really am. I can fool most of the people most of the time and do everything right, but I know who I am. I'm broken. I'm a mess. And so God has to bring what he said would happen. It would brought death. And he has to make them leave perfection and go out now into the world, not as an image of him, but as in the image of one that they chose to follow. You see, because what happened was not only did sin enter into us, we gave the right to rule and reign as God's children. We gave that rule over to Satan. Now Satan had the authority to rule and reign on this planet. And when that image died, the image of Satan came in. And this is what has been reproduced over and over and over again because there was a law God put in place that like we pr will reproduce after like after its own kind in the Old Testament when we read the stories of the Old Testament it is a picture and even if you just look around the world today of what it looks like when this kind of image and likeness is recreated over and over and over again see they had only known love. They had only known trust with each other. What was the first thing that happened? The blame game. Not my fault. It was her. I'm not, no, 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 it was my fault. I'm innocent. I, I don't deserve anything. That's unfair. It's her fault. No, 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 it's not my fault. It's that, it's that serpent's fault. And then God says another thing when he's talking to him, he said, listen, you guys were made equal. As husband and wife, you were made equal. As man and woman, you were made equal. Now, hmm, there's going to be a breaking between husband and wife. You're going to want to be at a, even playing with him, but now he's going to become an authority and a ruler. He will no longer see you as what I made you to be as a wife. You're going to be less than. Now the whole thing about, oh, you're different than me. I'm better than you. Boom. Hey, oh, nice shirt. Oh, lovely shawl. I think I want that. I don't care if you don't want to give it to me. I want that. I'm bigger than you and older than you and stronger than you, and I can put you down. Boom. I want to expand my kingdom. I want your land. Your people will be my people. You will be my servants and my slaves. Boom. Boom. This is the reproduction of this image. And the whole Old Testament shows that over and over and over again. And God now, the, there's a dilemma. What's God going to do about this? What is God going to do about this problem? Now, at one point, it had gotten so bad that God said, it said he regretted, in a sense, that he had made man. Things had gotten so evil you think this is the worst of times? <laughs> let's, let's go back to right before the flood. It was so bad, and there were no image bearers. 
except for one man, evidently, in his family that got said, I'm wiping them all out. But because I had created, I don't want to get rid of all, I'm just going to do restart button. So he floods the earth. He saves Noah and his family in the ark and, some, and the animals and stuff so it can reproduce and repopulate. And he's like, okay, here's the promise. And he gives them a promise and he tells them again, go out and rule and reign, multiply, bring my image and my likeness. But even coming out of the ark, they didn't get it right. God said, Noah, you and your wife walk out together. You and your sons and their wives, they walk out together. We're going to restart this over. And it says, Noah, what Noah does is Noah and his sons walk out first, and then the women follow. Because really, it didn't take care of this. And then God starts to intervene with those who would give him the, right, the opportunity to be in relationship with him. And he does some things in place and he puts, he's picking people out, you know, he calls Abraham because God's got a plan because part of the other thing at the beginning was he looked at the woman and he gave the first promise and the illusion that he had a plan in place. He said, your seed is going to crush that serpent's head. And so there's this hope thrown out there. So it goes on and on for hundreds and thousands of years and all this stuff is going on. And then I have this picture. Jesus is up in heaven and he's going, is it time yet? God's going, no, not quite yet. Okay, and so we're rocking along and there's wars and slaughter and all unimaginable things that are going on. And then finally, when the time is right, the father looks at Jesus and he goes, it's time. And all the promises that had been growing and building throughout the Old Testament that we see in the prophets and all this kind of stuff, saying, in the future, there's going to be someone who comes and he's going to be the one who sets it all right. When he comes, the kingdom of God will be here. And God looks at Jesus and he goes, all right, son, it's time. Now, Duke talked about the fact that it was important it come through a virgin birth. Why? Can you put the dots together? The likeness issue. If Jesus had had Joseph as his human father, hey, Joseph, hey, look, we have Joseph right here. <laughs> Joseph is a great guy, but if he had been born to Joseph, this would have been reproduced. This would have been reproduced. That's why it was important that Jesus' father was Father God through the power of the Holy Spirit who came over Mary. Because when Jesus was born, this is what happened. The new Adam, the second Adam. When Jesus came, he had the image and the likeness of the Father. That's why Jesus could say, when you see me, you see the Father. This is who he was. He wasn't this. He was perfect. So Jesus comes and he grows up and he begins his ministry when it was time and he goes around and he starts doing and being who we were always meant to be and do. He goes around and he starts bringing the kingdom. He would say, is there injustice? You're going to stone her because she was caught in adultery? You're condemning her? Boom. I don't. I choose to show mercy. You're blind and you're lame. It came as a result of of the curse, your body has been impacted. It's the rule and reign of the enemy in your life. Be healed. Boom. The woman who had the infirmity down in Colombia, who Duke saw the snake wrapped around her neck with spiritual eyes, and when he said, in the name of Jesus, leave her, boom, freedom. Everywhere Jesus went, he advanced the kingdom. He began to bring the rule and reign of God into the situation and into the world. And then the most incredible thing happened. 
See, there had been a, a system put in si place for forgiveness, animal sacrifices. Blood had to be shed. Do you know when the first blood was shed in the Bible to cover sin? In the garden. Because right before God sends them out, it says he took skins and sewed them together and covered them. Where did he get those skins? He killed animals. Blood was shed. And in the old covenant, that's what was there. Blood had to be shed to cover sin. So Jesus, though, he's going to do something totally different because the problem with that was you could cover the sin, but it never changed this. That's why I said year after year you'd have to go and you'd always be reminded, that's who I am, right? But Jesus comes and he tells his disciples, listen guys, I'm coming and I've got to die. And they're like freaked out, I can imagine. I don't blame them. I'd be freaked out too. He said, I've got to die because if I don't die, this is not going to be taken care of. So what Jesus does is on the last couple days of his life, he takes the disciples and he's talking to them about this and they're just, they're just like freaking out and going, no, 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 you can't die, you can't die or whatever. And finally he's going, listen guys, if I don't do this, you don't understand it now, but if I don't do this, things aren't going to change. So then we're in John and the book of John and Jesus in chapters, we notice chapter 16 and up and through 14, 15 and 16. He's been saying things like, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me and all this kind of stuff. And it gets kind of weird. And in 16, he does this amazing prayer that we call Jesus' high priestly prayer. And he says things like, okay, God, I'm in you and you're in me. And my prayer is for these guys and not only these guys, but those who are going to believe that, you know, that we'll all be together and we'll all be one in one. And it's kind of like, what is he talking about? But I believe in that moment because it's after he finishes that prayer that they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus begins to have his night of agony. And what happens is, as he's saying, put them in me, this is what starts to happen. See, Jesus didn't die for our sins. He died as sin. And God began to pour into Jesus the very nature of sin itself. The very nature of sin itself was poured into him. And just as sin affects the outside of us as well, the curse impacts everything, Jesus began to be beaten and tortured spit on all the things that affect us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the perfect Son of God became us. Jesus didn't die for us. It says he died as us. There's a big difference. See, if it was just about covering, there was a system in place. The animals could cover for sin, the actions. But the animals, it said the blood of bull and goats could not do the thing that needed to be done. So Jesus gets bruised, beaten, he's nailed to a tree. And because the very nature of sin, everything from all eternity past, to all eternity future for sin was poured into him on that day. And that's why he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the first time he knew and experienced separation from God, which is our lot. And God has to pull back for just a little while. But what Jesus did is he took the fruit of it, that fruit of sin that came into us, and he put it back on the tree. He took the image of the tree of where we took sin off of it and took it into ourselves. And he took that and he poured it into himself and he said, I am the perfect sacrifice for this and I am going to put it back on the tree. I'm going to take the very thing the enemy said and took and used death and destruction. I'm going to take his very tools and I'm going to kill them. And then Jesus goes into the grave. Jesus wasn't evidently an inactive dead person. 
It says, when he went into the grave, he descended, and he went down to the very throne of Satan himself. And he said, give them to me. And Satan went, I, uh-uh, he said, give them to me. It says he took back the keys. He took back the right to rule and reign in this world. He said, it is no longer yours. I took it to your battlefield. I met you head on, one on one, and I have won. Give it back. So Jesus takes it back. And how is the proof that he takes it back? Because on the third day, he raises from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit sent from Father God. Life exploded into the depths of death and hell. And out comes Jesus. Perfect and whole. The new Adam. Jesus comes out looking like this again. Now, that would be cool. But there's more to the story. See, what about these guys? What about his disciples and those who had been following him? And all that? They're running around going, Oh, my God, is gone. And Jesus shows up to the miraculous and says, Hey, guys, I'm back. <laughs> it can't be you. You died. I'm back. So we go through this whole thing. And he goes, Hey, all of a sudden it says, He's telling, I told you. Remember? Remember when I said this? Remember when I said that? And they're like, Ah. Oh, Oh, that's what you meant. Now you're speaking plainly. And he goes, guys, because you have remained faithful to me, even though they denied him and they fled and they scared, he still came to him and he goes, guys, guess what? Here's where it gets really good. You know that old system of animal sacrifice and all that kind of stuff? Remember I said, it's all done. New covenant, grace. Now watch what's going to happen. Guys, you're like this, watch. And he breathed into him, and the spirit of life came in. The spirit of life came in and restored the image. And then he goes, but hold on, there's more. He said, I want you to stay a while. I'm going to be with you for about 40 to 50 days. And in that time, he's explaining all sorts of things, and their minds have to be exploding at this point. He said, but whatever you do, don't leave until I send you the Holy Spirit. Because he's, got, he's already given you life, but he's going to now come and, and give you power and the ability to live this out, to be normal Christians. Because just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And I'm not going to send you out defenseless or powerless. I'm going to give you the authority of my name. You walk in my name. We said, what a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is. Those aren't just words. That's what we live by. And he said, watch this. And all of a sudden, they were all gathered together, and they were praying, and they were worshiping, and they were praising, and then the wind began to blow. It's always the wind, isn't it? And God began to breathe. And then what happened is the power of God, his very spirit began to pour and to flow and began to fill them. And all of a sudden they were hit, hit with being like Jesus. That's who we are. If we have accepted the gift of forgiveness God offers, he comes in and he takes what was broken and bruised and he goes, and he breathes in and it explodes and the Holy Spirit comes in and suddenly we walk around and creation recognizes. Ooh, there goes the son and daughters of God. And not only does creation recognize it, the demonic realm recognizes it too. They don't go, oh, there goes Marie. They go, oh, we know that spirit. There goes God's daughter, God's person. And we begin to rule and reign and our identity is secure because people, this is who we are. Yeah. Doubt will come and you'll say, I can't, oh man, is it really true? Life's been rough. I, oh God. 
I've, I've, I've messed up again. I've fallen back into some old things because the enemy's like going, see, it wasn't real. If you were really like Jesus, you wouldn't struggle with this. Ooh, that hit somebody. The truth is, this is who you are. The process comes here. Retraining what we think. What we think to be true. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He said he will lead us into all truth. And as that becomes more and more into our process, it begins to work out into our lives. But never doubt, if you have come to Jesus, this is who you are. Let's stand. Now for some of you, this isn't who you are. I don't care how good, quote unquote, you are. You don't spit, chew, go with people who do. <laughs> don't murder, don't steal. But if you have not come to Jesus and said, I'm grabbing on. This is not who you are. But this is who you were meant to be. Today's a good day. Grab on by faith and say, Jesus, I accept it. I want it. I'm yours. For others, it's just going back to this truth. It's been hard. It's been difficult. You've wondered. The experience of your life seems to point to the very opposite of this. If you go just by the experience or whether you think you're quote-unquote blessed or not, that was an old covenant view of it. Well, if you do right, things go right. You should, if you're favored and loved by God, everything in your life will be right, all that. No, that's works-based. This is grace. We could do nothing about it, and God could do everything about it, and he did. How great is this love? Musician. Let's close our eyes. Holy Spirit, you've just been here.